Well, I'll go ahead and get started then. Um, everybody, I hope you can bear with me. It's the first time I've taught this course in this format. So I'm generally used to, especially in this section, doing a lot of back and forth because uh, th there's a lot of opportunities for discussion on this one. I'll do my best here. And uh, if you have any questions, go ahead and uh, put them in the chat and um, I'll either try to answer them as we go or we can wait till the end. We are gonna be talking about uh, specifics of ordinance administration on this or basically how a local government might be suggested to uh, administer their floodplain regulations or in a few instances, how they may be required to do so. So let me start out with what are the uh, kind of topics that we're gonna be talking about during this section. We'll talk about the legal basis of the ordinance, um, the duties of the administrator. Uh, we will have some discussion on variances and there's often a lot of questions that arise on that um, in terms of when they might be applicable and if they ever are, how they might be administered and then talk about a little bit of some of the record keeping uh, practices that either should be or in some cases are required to be put into place. Uh, the regulations, uh, we've, we've gone over a lot of the, the sections throughout the, the course over the last day and a half, but let me just start out with Part 44 of the Code of Federal Regulations, Part 59, uh, lists actions that must be taken by the community to become eligible and to remain eligible for the program and the prerequisites for the sale of flood insurance. So you'll recall when we were talking earlier that the National Flood Insurance Program, or NFIP, if I just slip into that, is essentially a, an agreement between the federal government and a local community, whereby the local community agrees to enact a floodplain ordinance with a set of regulations in exchange for FEMA making uh, NFIP flood insurance available for anybody within that community. Okay, and so this is basically the, the statute that sets that up. Uh, in part 60.1, we talk about any community may exceed the minimum criteria by adopting more comprehensive floodplain management regulations. And in addition, any floodplain management regulation adopted by the state or the community, which are more restrictive than FEMA's minimum standards are encouraged and take precedence. So we've talked a lot over the last day and a half about the state rules and regulations that are stricter in a few instances than the FEMA minimums. I do definitely want to reiterate what the past speakers have said, which is, while I hope everybody in the course is aware of these higher standards, please keep in mind if you're going to follow this up with the CFM exam, the exam is based on FEMA minimum requirements. So for example, the, the state of Colorado has a one foot free board for all new and substantially improved structures. That does not exist with FEMA minimums. They, they only require going at the base flood elevation. That's one example. Uh, floodway criteria where the FEMA minimum discusses a one foot uh, surcharge, whereas the state requires a six foot maximum surcharge. If you're taking the test, please be sure to keep FEMA minimums in mind. But then also any community can exceed the minimum criteria by adopting more comprehensive floodplain management standards. And any community that has adopted the state uh, floodplain rules and regulations and every community that participates in the NFIP with the possible exception of one uh, that I'm aware of uh, has basically done all of these. So when you adopt the state floodplain rules and regulations, you have the, the one foot free board, you have the critical facilities requirement, you have the stricter floodway standard. These are all uh, in exceedance of the minimum criteria. In addition, there are a number of communities in our state that have also gone even beyond, beyond and beyond, excuse me, above and beyond those, or they have fought, uh, taken other regulations and uh, adopted regular standards that exceed those as well. That's always permissible to do as long as the community uh, does two things. They, in, they enforce them 
and they apply them uniformly throughout the community. Okay, as long as those two come into play, uh, the minimum, uh, these standards that exceed minimum criteria can be implemented and you can often get a community rating service credit for doing that. So when we talk about the ordinance, I, I imagine many of you know what, what we mean when we say that, but uh, just the definition you can see on the top of the slide here, the generic term for a law passed by a local government. Um, so floodplain regulations can be found in a number of locations. And I, I just wanna take a step back for a second. And the whole reason that this entire section exists is because there's no one way to administer a floodplain ordinance. Uh, FEMA requires that the community adopt and implement an ordinance, but nowhere in there will they say, this is exactly how you have to do it. There just has to be some process in place that is sufficient in order to administer these regulations. So for example, uh, you will find in different local governments, they have different places within their suite of local ordinances where they even put their floodplain regulations. And here are, are five examples that you'll see right here. Uh, zoning ordinances, uh, building codes. I would say that that might be the most common one where a building permit serves as a de facto floodplain development permit if the building is taking place within a special flood hazard area. Um, there can also be subdivision regulations, um, sanitary regulations. That one may sound a little bizarre to, to some of you, but uh, there are some instances, I can think of at least one for example, in Western Colorado, where a, a local government, a county in this case, does not have a building permit system. So they can't tie floodplain regulations to that. Where they get most of their residents coming in for permitting processes is for septic tanks. And so uh, because that's a hook to get people to come in and get permits issued, they tie their floodplain regulations to their septic ordinance and they have their county sanitarian as their floodplain administrator. Another common way to do it is the standalone ordinance where you just create an entirely new section within your local ordinance. And you may even have a standalone floodplain development permit that is not actually a component of any of these other regulations. Again, any one of these is fine as long as there is some permitting process in place that can address the floodplain regulations. Okay, I've already talked a little bit about this, but the ordinance must be legally enforceable. So if there is a violation or an attempt to have a violation uh, on the minimum requirements for that community's ordinance, there has to be some mechanism for which uh, the community can take action to ensure that the local ordinance can be followed. And I'll talk about some of these uh, enforcement mechanisms here a little bit later applied uniformly throughout the community. Well, what do we mean by that? What we mean is that you cannot say, well, there's just this special district over here where the floodplain regulations will apply, but for the rest of our community, uh, they, will not, uh, they will not be uh, regulated. You, you can't do that. So you have to say, if we are going to pass some kind of floodplain regulations, it applies to the entire community. And then taking precedence over less restrictive requirements. We talked earlier about that, how uh, you can uh, go above and beyond minimums, as well as anything that's less restrictive in your community. Okay, so duties of the administrator. Uh, you can read through all of these, um, but the point is every community must uh, identify a floodplain administrator within their regulation, and then that administrator is going to be responsible for all of what you see on here. Um, I, I would say the top two are going to be the most important. The administrator should understand what their community's regulations are, and then making sure that permits are obtained. And you can see all of the other uh, uh, duties right there. Now there's a couple ways that a community administrator can be defined. Um, the mo by far the most common is to 
select a position within the community, whether it's the city manager, whether it's the public works director, or whoever the community identifies as the floodplain administrator. They can also be called out by name, but um, that's not advised because as soon as that person leaves, then the, uh, the ordinance has to be updated. Any person can be named the administrator as long as they are prepared to follow all of these actions and hopefully are given local support for doing so. Uh, ensuring permits are obtained. Uh, I'll ask, and again, I don't have uh, back and forth here, so I guess I'll just have you answer to yourself, but is a community floodplain administrator required to do inspections? And then below is a community administrator responsible for enforcement. My answer would be no on the top, yes on the bottom. Um, inspections are a very good way to ensure that the flo uh, local floodplain regulations are uh, done properly. I would recommend any floodplain administrator or whoever they have working for them uh, do inspections if they have the time and the resources available to do so. But there's nothing in FEMA minimum requirements that says uh, floodplain administrators shall do inspections. It's just a very good way to make sure that the provisions are followed. But enforcement, there, there is an absolute requirement for that. Uh, again, you can read this, ensuring all development in the floodplain has a permit and is built according to floodplain, or excuse me, approved plans in compliance with regulations. If that is not followed, the community is expected to take enforcement actions, which I will talk about here in a little bit. Okay, we have talked about this in past sections, but just to reiterate, development permits encompass far more than just the construction of new buildings or even the rehabilitation of existing buildings. It, it includes just about anything, any kind of action that can be take that can take place um, in this case within special flood hazard areas. So you can read through all of these, but just some examples of actions that might often be overlooked uh, as considered development, which would require a permit. Let's say you excavate uh, an area to put in underground utilities, and then you plan on filling it back in to the exact same grade once you're done. Is that considered development? Absolutely. So even though the intent from before the project even starts is to uh, restore the grade that existed prior to the project and everything takes place underground. That is still an example of a development permit that has to be sought after and obtained prior to construction. One area where we see many local communities falling short is uh, permitting themselves. So you may have another department within your own municipality, for example, um, that, that, off, that might do, for example, road work or utilities or anything that you see on the screen right here. A community is actually required to permit itself and keep that information in the permit files uh, in order to properly regulate its ordinance. So just take a look through uh, this list here. And if you see examples that, that might surprise you, uh, make a note of that. Now, um, it, it, it's kind of in vogue to just say development encompasses anything that can be done. And I, I have always disagreed with that uh, to some extent, and this is where there's a bit of a gray area. Um, so I might ask you, uh, do you believe that a permit is required if a resident wants to put up a mailbox in front of their yard um, uh, or if they need to replace a fence post in their yard if if they're in a special flood hazard area and, and I think or let's say uh, do some minor uh, landscaping within their their yard I think this the, the NFIP does give quite a bit of latitude to local administrators in terms of what constitutes some kind of major uh, process. I would say in all three of the examples I just gave, uh, repairing a fence post, uh, putting up a mailbox or minor 
landscaping within the yard, I would probably, in most cases, re not require a resident to get a floodplain development permit for that. But there may be other examples where it's not quite as obvious. Let's say a property is located within a special flood hazard area and there's no fence currently up around it and they want to put up a, a six foot cedar fence uh, in in the direction of the flow. Well, that's going to represent a very clear barrier to conveyance um, if that area is within the special flood hazard area and is conveying flood water. So that would be an example of where I would think you probably want to have them coming in uh, applying for a permit and giving the local community a chance for review. We can discuss any any ideas you have or questions on this if uh, anybody has any uh, at the appropriate time. Ensuring permits are obtained needed for all changes to floodplains. Uh, let's see, I'll just let you read through here, but one, one provision is for the floodplain administrator to ensure that all federal and state permits are obtained. Uh, you will find that in minimum uh, ordinance standards and I guess I'll just ask the question how do many of you ensure that that is done if if you're on the, the webinar here and you represent a local government uh, whether you're the floodplain administrator or not. The most common way that this is done is to I, is identify what permits may be necessary and then make the issuance of the of the permit conditional on receiving all of these federal and state permits. So uh, I've, I've never interpreted it as a responsibility of the local government to actually go out and get those federal and state permits, but they should be at least monitoring to make sure that the applicant is able to do so if needed. Uh, if the if the application is compliant with regulations, the permit can be issued. If not, the permit can be not denied, and it it may be that you uh, deny the permit, but put it back on the applicant and say uh, you, you have fallen short in in these areas, this and this and this. And if you can remedy these and fix this, come back and uh, resubmit the application, and we may be able to issue the permit at that time. Okay, there are some certifications that may be required as part of the permitting process. And if these permitting, or excuse me, these certifications are needed, these should be obtained and uh, remain within the permit file as part of the file that can be inspected later on. Let me start with the flood proofing certificate. And I don't know how much we've talked about this, but just to, as a reminder, the NFIP allows that non-residential buildings can be floodproofed, and, and flood proofing is an engineered process where uh, special construction techniques and special materials can be used to make a building essentially watertight. Okay, so that allows the lowest floor to be placed below the base flood elevation, but because of the techniques used in construction, uh, the water is not allowed to enter the building. Because this is an engineered process, this is something that should have an engineer's certification. And again, that should remain part of the permit file once it's stored. Uh, a couple of important things, especially that I want you to know if you're going to be taking the test. Um, for insurance rating only, uh, one foot is subtracted from the floodproofed elevation when that uh, structure is rated for flood insurance. This is only for insurance. Uh, as far as regulations go, flood proofing is considered equivalent to elevation when non-residential buildings are taken into account. So. You could have a base flood elevation of, let's say, 5280, um, a mile high. Uh, if that's what the base flood elevation is, then the flood proofing, the building should be flood proof to an elevation of 5280 or higher based on FEMA minimums again. Okay, but let's say that the building is flood proof to that 5280 elevation. What will happen then is if the building obtains a flood insurance, 
uh, a flood insurance policy, either because it's required to as part of a mandatory purchase or whether the business or building owner just wants to, uh, to protect themselves from the flood hazard. What would happen is that that building would be rated only to an elevation of 5279. And so if there is any, any kind of insurance being sought uh, at any point, either now or in the future, it would be highly recommended, even under FEMA minimum standards, for that building to be flood proof to an elevation at least a foot higher than the base flood elevation. Okay, and in Colorado, you would have to do that anyway. Um, so keep that in mind, but as far as regulations go, uh, flood proofing and uh, elevation are considered to be equivalent. Again, an engineer's certification that the building is properly flood proofed is required and should be kept within the uh, permit file. A couple more certifications that may be uh, needed from time to time. We've talked about floodways and what the requirements are for floodways, specifically that any action that is taking place within a floodway area has to demonstrate a no rise, which means that you cannot show any increases to uh, base flood elevations unless a conditional letter of map revision has been applied for and received before the construction begins. So unless there's a clomer in play, uh, it's just a rule that you cannot create a rise in base flood elevations due to an action that takes place within the floodway. And the way that a local administrator can ensure this is to require the applicant to provide a no rise certification. Now, uh, in this particular case, there's no formal uh, required document that FEMA would, would require. There just has to be some kind of statement that is stamped by a professional engineer that, that states that there's no rise. You can find various copies of this, uh, perhaps worded a little bit differently uh, throughout the internet. Uh, many communities have a, a documentation form on hand that can be filled out by the engineer uh, when needed. Uh, it must be supported by engineering analysis and technical data. Um, and then once you get that engineering certification, that project can move forward if the community is comfortable with it. Something that will is not and hopefully never will be required within Colorado, but something you should be aware of if you're taking the CFM exam. In V zones, buildings that uh, are in coastal high hazard areas must be engineered to resist wind and water impacts simultaneously. I never deal with this, so I can't really expand on that, but just be aware that that uh, requirement exists. Okay, so now we're, let's talk about the enforcement actions that I mentioned earlier. So this is uh, these are the actions that need to come into play when a community uh, attempts to issue their ordinance, but uh, either because of misunderstandings or perhaps a recalcitrant uh, applicant, uh, there's an action taking place that uh, is a violation of that local ordinance. Uh, here's a list of four steps that you can read and we'll go over all of these. Um, this would be an order of, I'll, I'll say, least problematic on the top down to kind of the nuclear option uh, on the bottom. Voluntary compliance, of course, this is gonna be your first course of action and where you, where you will hope uh, the effectiveness can come into play. Voluntary compliance just means you, you educate the property owner what they did wrong, talk to them about the ordinance and just see if there's something that they can do on a voluntary level to bring their project into compliance. Of course, this is easier that the earlier you catch this in a, in a project, which is why those inspections I talked about are a good idea if you can do them. Um, it's much harder to bring a, for example, a home into compliance if it's already done being built and has been built too low. That's when this can get really messy, but if you can catch things early on, then the benefit is that you can, you can usually get things to stop here. Uh, if that doesn't work, then you can move on to the next item, which are administrative steps. This is where 
uh, you will issue notices uh, or stop work order. Uh, not issuing a certificate of occupancy is something that often gets people's attention and, and can force some action right there. If these still don't pre, uh, fix the problem, then you can start moving on to violations and penalties. Uh, you can issue fines and say, for every day that this hasn't been fixed, uh, you're being charged $200, for example. Injunctions, um, recordation is a very useful tool. And if that's a term that you've never heard of before, what that basically means is, uh, putting a note on the property owner's deed saying this structure has not been built in compliance with local ordinance and, and, and is a violation of our own uh, uh, floodplain ordinance. That can become a problem because then when they try to sell their property, the property owner and perhaps everybody associated with them, such as their uh, lender um, and insurer, we'll have a note right there that says, uh, this is a hazardous situation and it may limit the ability to sell that property because of the problems that may occur once it's bought. Uh, section 1316 is what I call the nuclear option here. And I, I'm not sure that that has already been discussed in this uh, webinar. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and explain what this is. This is the one example that uh, to what we've been saying all along. What we've been saying is if a community adopts a floodplain ordinance uh, and uh, adopts a resolution to participate in the National Flood Insurance Program, we've been saying flood insurance is available to anybody within that community. And almost entirely in the time that that is true, but this is the exception to that. Section 1316 of the National Flood Insurance Act is a provision where uh, a property owner within the, a, an NFIP participating community is no longer able to purchase flood insurance. Um, it becomes unavailable to them through the NFIP. And basically what happens here is the community alerts FEMA, hey, I've done everything in the three steps above. I've, we have made a, a complete good faith effort to bring this property in, into compliance and the property owner either cannot or will not bring it into compliance, we don't have any more tools, we don't know what else to do. And so the final action can be that the, the property owner is denied the ability to purchase flood insurance even though they reside in an NFIP participating community. That may not sound like a big deal, but it can be an extremely big deal because if the property owner has a mortgage attached to any structures on this property uh, and they're in a special flood hazard area, then they would be uh, subject to the mandatory purchase requirement through federal rules, but then they would be unable to obtain a flood insurance policy because of this provision. And so therefore they would be unable to carry a mortgage on that property. Uh, I guess if they pay cash for it, then it may be something that they can work around. But if a mortgage is needed, I think it wouldn't be workable in this kind of situation. Record keeping. Uh, the floodplain administrator for the community should keep a uh, permits on file uh, and, and keep them available either for the state or for FEMA to uh, audit them as needed to ensure compliance with the provisions of the National Flood Insurance Program. So keep the permit file, uh, keep all of the certifications in place, so the flood proofing and the no rise that we talked about. And I do want to talk a little bit about elevation certificates. Uh, again, I'm a little unsure as to what all we've talked about so far. Um, I know you've talked about what elevation certificates are and what they're used for, but uh, I'm, I'm not sure we've talked about when they're needed or when they're optional. So elevation certificates uh, can be used to demonstrate compliance with regulations because it shows all of the uh, elevations and if you can show that your lowest floor is at or above the base flood elevation then you can show compliance. Uh, the elevation certificate itself is not a permit but can be used to support the permit but more importantly it also supports insurance rating. 
I don't believe there's a mechanism where insurance can be properly rated uh, without the information that's shown in the elevation certificate, because you need to have some kind of declaration of what the zone is, and in many cases, what, what the various elevations are, your lowest floor, your lowest adjacent grade, the reference elevation, um, which, which may be the base flood elevation in a zone AE, that kind of information is needed to uh, properly rate a structure for a flood insurance policy. Now, of interest to the community where it is required to use these is if the community participates in the community rating system. It is a prerequisite even at a, a level nine for communities to uh, keep, uh, keep these uh, certificates on file as part of the, the permit file. So if your community is in the CRS, you should be getting elevation certificates every time and keeping them on file. If your community is not in the CRS, there's no FEMA requirement for you to keep them at least as part of the permitting process. But I still think it's something that if, if you're able to get them, they're just good documentation that can support uh, your community's compliance with the NFIP. So while it may not be a requirement, I, I would probably recommend doing them anyway if it's something that you have the, uh, the ability and the resources to, to do. Okay, discussing variances. So uh, in, in most of these land use type ordinances, there has to be some kind of uh, relief function in the form of a variance that, that can be available under extreme circumstances. And the NFIP and, and floodplain regulations are no different. Where I do think they are different is that variances uh, for various other local land use processes can some in some cases appropriately be uh, approved on a, on a fairly lenient basis, you know, and, and these could be things like setback requirements from the street or height requirements in your building, uh, zoning variances, uh, anything like that. If there's a good reason to do it, um, then, then the community can go ahead and, and do that. I would recommend all communities think long and hard before issuing variances to floodplain regulations, however, um, because of the public safety component, um, as well as the agreement that exists between the local government and FEMA. FEMA generally views all variances in, in a fairly negative light. Um, th there may be some circumstances where they can be justifiably offered, but I would I would submit to you that the issuance of a variance to a floodplain regulation will be an automatic red flag at the start uh, for both the state and FEMA uh, in viewing the e efficacy of a, of a community's floodplain management program. So what is a variance? It's a grant of relief from the regulations. Um, and let's see, it's a local decision uh, and follow, okay, one, one thing I really want to emphasize here, and this is something that I, I, I know has been discussed on the test, at least in past years, is that the, the decision to issue a variance from the floodplain uh, regulations should be related to property issues and not personal issues. So let's say you have an applicant come in and says, um, I live below the poverty line. I need to fix up my house and I just don't have the money to spend extra money to make my structure uh, compliant with the, with the local ordinance. That would be an example of a very bad reason to issue a floodplain variance. Um, another example would be, um, let's say you have a, an applicant uh, that has uh, handicap accessibility issues. So let's say you have an applicant come in, their, their mom's 90 years old and, uh, and it has to get around with the use of a wheelchair. Is it okay for the applicant to come in and say, I just have no way to get my mom into the house uh, if I follow the local floodplain ordinance? Um, 
I would say the answer is no. And in fact, I would really say it's no because the last thing you want to do is put somebody with mobility issues into a greater public safety risk by not allowing them to, or not requiring them to comply with the program. So you may say, no, you still have to follow the floodplain regulations and elevate the home, but perhaps you can install a ramp that allows the wheelchair to get up to the front door. Um, you may have to get creative in some cases, but those would be two examples that many of you possibly have heard already, but would be very problematic to issue a variance. If there is a good reason related to the property, and I always struggle to come up with any, I just I just don't think variances are ever good ideas in this program, but uh, during the discussion, if, if we wanna talk about that, uh, we can. Um, one th an Another thing that I do want to uh, mention in regards to the variance, and I don't know if this, yeah, this is on the next uh, slide, so let me go ahead and, and move it over here. Uh, we've talked about a lot of this right here. Um, we talked about hardship there. Uh, doesn't create threats to public safety, must not, blah, blah, blah. You can see all those, I'll let you read them. I want to point you to the bottom bullet, however, which is that flood insurance rates cannot be waived. Despite everything that I've just told you, if, the, if you can come up with a situation where it actually is appropriate and advisable to issue a variance to the floodplain rules, um, it's important to note that the flood insurance rates don't change as a result. It, it, the raters don't say, oh, well, since you got a variance, we're gonna rate this structure differently. No, they're not gonna do that. So. What might happen then is, is you can give an applicant relief from the regulations themselves, but then when they go to get a flood insurance policy, um, probably because they have to if they have a mortgage, they could have a sky high uh, insurance policy um, that is a direct result of how they built the house according, or the property, excuse me, according to the variance. So um, that's definitely something that I, I would like you to consider if you ever issue a variance or are considering it. So then the summary here, we've talked about all of these already, uh, and I'll let you kind of read that. And I believe that is the final slide. So, uh, it's really weird doing this without the back and forth, but uh, I guess let's check in and see if anybody has any questions. So this is Diana, Kevin. On the variance issue, I'll give you a, a prime example. There was a property owner in the state of Florida a couple of years ago who was wheelchair bound. They lived in an, uh, they lived in an elevated building and they were going to convert the lower area into an apartment for the uh, for the wheelchair bound person. She applied for a variance. Uh, she was denied. Uh, she uh, went to court. Uh, the court said, "Yes, you must issue the you must issue the variance." So she won, uh, and you can guess what happened. Uh, yeah. The flood. They had four feet of water. Now, if you're sitting in a wheelchair. That's about chest high. Uh, and she sued the city again for allowing the variance and won. So, you know, you can be damned if you do and damned if you don't. Uh, but it, as Kevin said, it is highly encouraged not to, to waive the floodplain management requirements. If you've got a height requirement or a setback requirement, that's the one you might want to vary instead of the floodplain because it's less likely to cause injury to the property owner or to the first responders when something does happen. All right, what do we got, Chris? Um, latest one from Daniel says, why have a variance then if you're not gonna be issued? <laughs> I, I, and I'll just give you my answer to that, and maybe Diana has something to add, but I think any time you have a, a land use requirement, I think you have to have at least some procedure for relief if there's ever an appropriate circumstance. Um, so I, I think it's just something you, you have to do from a legal standpoint is make that available. I just can't think of a situation off the top of my head where it would be appropriate. 
Um, there, you know, let's say there's a, an outcropping, we live in the mountains and there's an outcropping and they can't elevate the structure to the base flood, then you can do it to the maximum extent possible and allow that variance. And that would be, that would, <clears throat> once you provide the documentation, that would be um, okay with us. Kevin, during your presentation, there were uh, uh, several back and forths and, and Caitlin asked me some very good questions. Uh, you might scroll through that real quick and and I check don't know how to scroll it. through it while I'm sharing my screen. Uh, well, yeah, no, you can't. Uh, oh, okay. You have to un unshare and then you can see the chat, I believe. Okay. Um, Is there anything we need to discuss? I, I'm happy to look at it when I'm done, but uh, I don't want to leave anybody uh, hanging on anything here. Um, I'll I'll ask back to Caitlin. She. Uh, I, we, we talked about the, the no rise and how that's applied in a zone A. Um, and I said, no, you have to do an engineering analysis if there's a zone A, but, but you're allowed to cause a rise up to the um, surcharge, the, the regional surcharge. So in Colorado, you could, in a zone A, do construction that causes up to a six inch rise um, and, uh, uh, you know, nationally that would be one foot, but it, it, uh, she's citing that there's a slide that conflicts with that. So maybe I'm not exactly correct. Well, keep in mind that in a zone A, there's no floodway delineated right. and, and there's right. really no provision even for kind of the, a pseudo floodway, uh, type thing. So, um, that no rise requirement would not not exist in a zone A. Okay, yeah, take, take, take your regulator hat off. Um, what I've required a, an applicant to do in that situation is um, give me a no impact certification, you know, so they're not having to certify to an eighth of an inch, 0 0.01 foot, um, that there is no rise. Um, you know, they might document and, and they've done an analysis and they said, well, at this cross section, it's, you know, 0 0.06 feet. At this cross section, it's gone down 0 0.12 feet. And at this cross section, it's gone up 0.18 feet, you know, so two and a half inches. Um, and and they're, they're saying, it's my professional opinion that there is no impact on adjacent or uh, properties or insurable structures. And that's been an acceptable statement to me when there's a zone A. Yeah, that sounds great. Okay. And, and you know, let, let me, uh, at the risk of going too far off script here, let me just uh, kind of present a, a situation which, which comes up all the time. And, and you heard from Doug Mahan yesterday. I don't know if he's on here today, but uh, he's our state's uh, National Flood Insurance Program Coordinator and, and works in my section. One of the calls he and I get a lot would be uh, calls to the state from a property owner residing wherever in, in whatever community saying, uh, the local government's making me jump through all these hoops and can you please talk them out of that because I don't think that I should have to do that. Um, we get that surprisingly often. I wouldn't be surprised if FEMA gets that kind of thing as well, but, but I know that we do. How do, you think we, how do you think we would respond to that? And again, this is where I can't see what people are going to say, so I'll just <laughs> give you the answer. But um, I, there's a very definite answer that I would provide, which is, remember what I showed you earlier in this section, that a community can take any approach they want to administer in their ordinance, including going above and beyond uh, minimum requirements, be they federal or state. So it is the, the local government, especially in this state, that is responsible for uh, doing floodplain regulation within their community. Uh, Doug and I are not going to put ourselves in the situation of telling a community, you can't do that, even if it's in excess of what we require at the state level. 
The only time we might intervene is if it becomes obvious that the community doesn't necessarily want to do that, but maybe they misunderstand what their requirements are from state or federal uh, requirements. And they're worried about getting in trouble if they don't do something that they don't really have to do. And if that's the case, we, in certain circumstances, we may tell the community, you don't necessarily have to do that. You're not gonna get in trouble. But I will always tell a community that if that's what you want to do and you have a reason for doing it, you have the ability to do that. Does that make sense? Okay. Basically, local control is very important in this program. Uh, the FEMA and the state just sets minimum requirements, but the regulation, the enforcement, and all of the permitting happens at the local level. So please remember that. Yeah, and, and Kevin, what you were just citing goes back to um, what the handbook goes into a little more depth on, on, on what might be considered a taking. And, and it cites, um, several court cases um, where it was found not to be a taking, but then there were some actions that the community took that, that was considered a taking. And so, uh, you know, you, you can kind of read through that for guidance. You know, if, if you're just outright prohibiting anything in the floodplain and you haven't found that it's in the public interest to do so, um, then yeah, you might you might be told that that's a taking, um, and and what I've seen, um, and and I don't write or participate in ordinances too often, but what I've seen in ordinances is usually one of the first paragraphs is saying the city of X finds that it is in the public interest to protect for this 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 and reason. Therefore, it is adopting the following standards. And, and that's what would be presented in court if someone sued you and said you went too far. You know, you, you've done your homework, you've stated why you as a community believe it's in the public interest to adopt this standard. It's not punitive, it's not a taking. We think, you know, kind of like the Illinois case that uh, was cited. Um, in my presentation, you know, the Supreme Court found in the state of Illinois that no, you can prohibit building in the floodplain. Sure, you can argue that you can elevate it or you can floodproof a commercial building, uh, non-residential building. So you've got a, a VFW hall full of people and it's surrounded by floodwaters. How are you now going to evacuate them out of that hall? So let me give you another example that we get all the time particularly after a disaster. You've got a, an existing structure that's been accounted in the floodway and it becomes substantially damaged from whatever reason. City of Oklahoma City had in their ordinance that no development in the floodway. So when we talk about no development, that would also include substantial improvements or substantial damage. So when, when the property owner went to get a permit to rebuild, um, they were denied. And we, FEMA, had to say, community, you can't do that because that would then be a taking unless you provide justification that, or, or compensation, I should say, to that property owner. So what we had to advise the, the community is, yes, you can rebuild on the same footprint because we have already accounted for that structure to be in the floodway when we did our model, when our study. So the city of Oklahoma City had to change their ordinance from that. Now, uh, same way with new development. If they don't allow development in the floodway, how is that person going to use that property? That would be a taking issue. So then they, you know, you have to follow the, re the regulations with regards to development in the floodway, you know, no rise things like this for, for when you have a new structure going in. But if there's an existing one there, we've accounted for it, 
um, they have to allow that to rebuild on the same footprint. Yeah, and, and, and so I, I hope we've talked about this. Uh, I, I think I've heard it mentioned, but, um, and Diana, correct me if there's any updated information on this, but I have always been told since I've been in this position that uh, FEMA minimum requirements, they've never lost a, a, a takings uh, challenge. Correct, is, correct. That, is that correct, still true? Correct. Okay. That is still true. And so I, I think what Diana says is correct where uh, the problem comes in when you just outright prohibit something. Uh, what 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 NFIP requirements sometimes do is is make things extraordinarily difficult in the name of public safety, and and that's okay. Uh, um, we actually do that intentionally. Um, I get calls all the time from people complaining about uh, how hard it is to build a house in a floodway. And, and the response that I always give is it, it should be hard. Um, if you can figure out a way to actually do it and, and truly justify it from an engineering standpoint, be my guess that that's your right to do that. But that, that's the difference is that whether it's hard or not, there is at least a provision where uh, some use of the property is available under the right circumstances. Um, right. It, it, it's when we, outright prohibit something that I think the, the issue for takings can come into yeah. play. Yeah, and we're all about risk communication. If you allow that development in that flood way, just let them know, you know what? When it floods, that structure is going to be damaged. It may be destroyed. It also may cause damage to other properties because that debris has got to go downstream and can clog your your, your stormwater uh, systems, it can clog, clog a bridge and cause damage to other structures. So it's, it's communicating what can happen when it does flood, not if, but when. Yeah, I had a situation um, many years ago uh, in, in a cheese land far, far away where a, a property owner came in to our community um, and wanted to put in apartments and they were all going to be above the base flood elevation, but his only access was across a, a small stream, but it, it still had a mapped floodplain. Um, and I think the highway culvert downstream of that was a twin eight by 10 box. So you can imagine the flows that would come through there. And we said, no, you know, that, can't be accessed in a flood. We said, you may still use your property. You may put your own single family home up there, but we're not gonna let you put 20 people or 20 uh, families at risk um, by putting them in, in an area that we can't get to in a minor flood, much less a major, major flood. Um, so we didn't deny the use of the property outright, but we denied the proposed use of that property due to the access. We had a whole bunch of questions um, come in during this discussion. Um, Charles asked, can we discuss the distinction between floodway and regulatory floodway? Um, it's my understanding that they are synonymous. Um, yeah, I, I use the terms interchangeably. Right. Okay. Um. Travis just added, added a, uh, had a great question with regards to variance and a known problem issue when you're in the middle of a study process. So you, the community, can use your best available data to regulate development uh, in floodplains, either if, even if they're not identified on the effective map. You can use that uh, best available data, the preliminary map, um, the uh, pending map to regulate development uh, to, the, to those maps that have not even gone effective. That occurs all the time. I'd be a little leery of that as a local official um, because sometimes maps do get appealed and so forth. We've allowed um, clomers. Um, we've allowed, um, you know, preliminary uh, grading and so forth. But uh, un 
especially for residential, until that letter of map revision or physical map revision is issued, we will not allow a residential lot to even touch the floodplain. Um, and that that's how we treat it. We, we regulate to the uh, most restrictive. Um, now, if someone's gotten a Loma, um, to say, nope, this part of the lot that I want to build on is above it, um, then we allow that. Um, Jennifer asks, Kevin, is the local government's ordinance required to specifically support, quote, what it wants to do? Um, and if you don't understand that, um, I'll ask Jennifer to unmute her. I think I understand the question, but if if I'm not answering it, then yeah, Jennifer, go ahead and, and, and jump on. So um, okay, the advice I give thank any local, what? I just said, thank you for answering my question. You've got oh, it. absolutely. The advice that I give any local government is make sure that any process that you undertake is legal at the local level. And if you're doing anything, that is not explicitly called out within your ordinance and you think could be problematic, I would suggest running it by your local attorney before doing so. But it's not its not in the state's role and, and or probably in the feds role either to say that you have to do anything um, like that. We generally just say a community has the right to exceed the, the minimum requirements that the state and the feds put out. And if they go beyond that, that's, that's their prerogative, but I think ensuring the legality of it is probably a wise local step. Yeah, so in the instance of using a preliminary map or a pending map, you would have to adopt that preliminary or that pending map in order to regulate that higher standard, that best available data. Did I answer your question or, or was there something specific that you were? Um, thanks, yes. Kevin. That's good. Um, I'm in okay. Estes Park, and we don't have the CRS in play. Okay. But I just um, I want to require a building to be flood proof, and I'm just not sure if I can do it. But thank you. I'll work on okay. it. Okay. And, and since you were asking, not in a hypothetical sense, but it sounds like you have an actual situation. If this is something you'd like to talk over, either give me or Doug a call um, at any time, and we'd be happy to talk through this with you. Yeah, and if it's if it's if you want to flood proof flood it is flood proofing is in the regulation, so it should be in your ordinance that you can require it to be flood proofed if it can't meet the elevation requirements. But is the issue that the maps haven't changed yet, and it's in an area where the maps will change too? Is that what you're asking? I, no, our ordinance has uh, adopted the most restrictive standard, which in our case in Estes Park is the Champ map. Okay. Soon to be submitted. Um, I've just got a guy wanting to re-put the new, a new facade on a building that's in the flood way, and I want him to flood proof what he's doing. I'm just not exactly sure if I can make him do it, but that's what I'm going to work on. Okay. Um, let's revisit that after the next section. Um, it may apply to it. We're starting to get a little over time, I'd like to give everybody a five to 10 minute break. Um, let's say we break now and come back at um, 10.05.